Hello, hello. Um, oh, that was a stupid introduction, wasn't it? Hello, my name's Mary English, and I'm a professional author and astrologer working in the UK. And today I'm going to be giving you a talk, a webinar about the planet Neptune. This particular talk is just intended for people that are the sign Pisces. So if you're a Pisces or you've got Pisces friends, it'd be lovely for you to join me. Uh, now, uh, I just need to tell you a little bit about myself. So there I am. I'm a professional astrologer. I work in private practice in the UK. I am the author of 16 plus books, one of which is called How to Survive a Pisces. And the reason that I wrote the book was to get people to understand more about our sign, because Pisces is one of the most misunderstood misunderstood signs of the zodiac. Uh, the other sign that's very, very misunderstood is Scorpio. So I, I empathize if you're either a Scorpio or a Pisces, you will be continually misunderstood. What the book does, How to Survive a Pisces, it tells you how astrology works, what it's all about, and how to not misunderstand your Pisces. But the book is written from the perspective of people that know that sign rather than that they are that sign themselves. So there's one for each sign of the zodiac. And I recently published another book, uh, this one self-published, and it's called The Astrology of Lovers. So if you're a lover, then you'll need to read that one too. So welcome again to My Name's Mayor English, and I'm an author, and this talk today is about Neptune. So what is Neptune? So of all the signs from Aries to Pisces, each of them has a planet that looks after them. And we use the term rules them. You could in a, in a way say they come from this planet because the planet describes the motivating forces of the sign. The rulerships were decided after years of argument and discussion amongst various astrologers, and it's still in dispute each time a new planet is discovered. So an understanding of Neptune as a planet and its attributes will help you make sense of understanding Pisces. So Neptune was nearly discovered by Galileo, who first saw it while he was observing the Jupiter system on the 28th of December 1612. And after the discovery of Uranus in 1781 by a chap called William Herschel, Incidentally, who's in Bath, UK, where I live, astronomers continue to observe the night sky and track the movement of other celestial bodies. However, Neptune's discovery wasn't made by observation. The astronomers who were working on the case used a thing called mathematical astronomy. So Uranus wasn't moving as predictions said it would, so the astronomers concluded that another planet must be affecting its orbit. Neptune was recorded several more times without being recognized as a planet over the following years. And eventually, Lalende, a French astronomer, recorded Neptune on the 8th and the 10th of May in 1795, thinking that it was a star. And William Herschel's son, John Herschel, who was involved with its discovery, recorded Neptune on the 14th of July, 1830, and also believed it was a star. However, a French chap named Urban Le Verrier, who worked at the Paris Observatory, used mathematical calculation to prove its existence and discovered a star with the tip of his pen without any instruments other than the strength of his calculations alone. And the Times carried the headline on the 1st of October 1846, Le Verrier's planet has been found. And as I say, he did it by the tip of his pen because he did it by mathematical um, calculations. He wasn't just observing the night sky like William Herschel was, because that's how he discovered Uranus. He'd actually invented um, uh, a telescope that had strong enough lenses in it so that he could see into the distance. But this chap, he, because Uranus was doing this erratic orbit, thought, well, there must be another planet that's affected it. So in the aftermath of the discovery, there was much nationalistic rivalry between the French and the British over who had priority for the discovery. And eventually, after considerable argument, it was decided to give the credit to both Urbain Le Verrier and Adams together. And their discovery was called Neptune. So Neptune, the planet, 
planet was found not by observation, as most of the other planets were discovered, but by mathematical means. So there he was sitting there with his pen, deciding how it happened and calculating it. And that was how the discovery was made. However, uh, it's a little bit sort of like uh, the reality of Pisces, that nobody sort of quite knew what was going on or who was there or what's happening. And it was only because somebody sort of investigated that bit further that they found out exactly what the planet was. So what you might be asking, what has that got to do with being a Pisces and how does it affect us? Well, as I've said already, the observation of modern astrologers on how the planets affects the various signs and also the characteristics of its orbits and its movements and what happened historically when the planet was discovered have all been taken into account. So Margaret E. Honey wrote in 1951 in her book, Modern Textbook of Astrology, more than 100 years ago after Neptune was discovered, this planet has to do with what hides itself from view. Hence, it's the most difficult for which to find a suitable one word description. So she goes on to use the words nebulousness, impressionability, artistic, dreamy, emotional, idealistic, imaginative, sensitive, subtle, sentimental, woolly, wandering and unstable, amongst others to convey the sort of themes that Neptune governs. Now, you could use those words also to describe a Pisces. <laughs> Hopefully that's not how people describe you. And, uh, and yeah, so that's just a little bit of information about Neptune. So uh, we're going to be discussing where and what's happening with Neptune in our lives and how has a Pisces you can work with the energies of this wonderful planetary happening and make it better and more fulfilling for us. So I am a reformed Pisces. I say reformed because I made a vow to myself not to display the worst parts of my sun sign characteristics. Yes, I'm sensitive. Yes, I'm empathic. Yes, I have had lots of suffering and sadness in my past. However, I've been working on myself long enough to know how to work with my sign and not destroy myself or others with my emotionalness now. So in this talk today, we're going to learn about what Neptune is and how we can tune into its benefits. We're going to learn what Neptune has taught others in the past we're also going to learn how Neptune is assisting some Pisces people right now and why, and how long we have to enjoy this transit and when the transit will peak for each of us and where to get extra information and further details. Now, in the description of this uh, webinar, there is a link there. If you click on that, it will take you to uh, a page that I've created. So you'll be able to sign up and get the free PDF from this talk. So if you haven't got time to listen to the whole thing, then please click on that, access the PDF and you'll have more information there. So my name's Mary English, I'm a professional astrologer working in private practice in the UK. Welcome to my webinar. Now, so plenty has been written about Neptune in myth and the Romans called him the god of the sea and he was Zeus's younger brother. He carried a trident which had three prongs, which can be seen as a glyph that astrologers now use. And in Roman legend, he was given the sea as his realm and he took over from the Greek god Poseidon's job of getting into tempestuous rages. His wife Amphitrite gave birth to a son called Triton and he was also famed for having love affairs and was the father of several other children who were wild and cruel. He was worshipped as the god of navigation and temples were erected in his honour. Both the Greeks and later the Romans felt that this god controlled the seas and when angry would cause storms and shipwrecks. Not a particularly friendly chap and he was prone to rubbing up the other gods the wrong way. So having a boss or ruler as incomprehensible as Neptune, who can so easily take you to the heights of spirituality and just as swiftly takes you to the depths of oblivion, you can see why Pisces, the dual fishes swimming in opposite directions, has a certain amount of karma to work through before they can be at peace with themselves or anyone else for that matter. So what has Neptune taught others in the past? 
Now, as I mentioned in the introduction to this talk, I am going to be using the charts of uh, a number of people. And the first one I want to demonstrate for you is um, a chap called Rudolf Steiner. Now, Rudolf Steiner was a, um, I don't know how you describe him, he was Austrian, I think was where he was born, and uh, he started a movement called the Steiner Movement interestingly because that's his surname and have you ever heard of Steiner or Waldorf schools that's your man he's the chappy that did this um, and uh, he was born in 1861 and we do have a uh, birth data for him but it's a little bit in dispute because one bunch of people say he was born on one date and another bunch of people say he was born on the other even though when he wrote his uh, I wouldn't call it his memoirs but when he wrote about himself um, he did mention his time of birth so you would have thought that people would trust what was written in his book but apparently they don't so anyway the chart that's in the PDF that you can download if you click on the link um, we have his chart and uh, I'm going to flash it into the screen. <laughs> it's going to mean absolutely nothing to you if you're not an astrologer. But anyway, I don't even know I can put it onto camera here, uh, but it, it will be in the PDF. So that's his chart there. And, and as you can see, he's got he's got most of his planets all the way around the circle. Um, here's his sun sign uh, in the sign of Pisces. If I can move my digity poops across here. I don't know which way I'm going. So there's his sun sign and the sign of Pisces. Oh, where's he gone? So that's his sun is there. So this section here is Pisces. There's his sun. And he's also got Mercury in the sign of Pisces. Now, he really was the epitome of Pisces person. Um, I don't know if you know much about the Steiner movement or the type of education that it endorses, but something like their philosophy is as this. So I'll describe his chart in a bit more, but let me just um, give you a quote here from, from Steiner education. So here we go. The priority of the Steiner ethos is to provide an unhurried and creative learning environment where children can find the joy in learning and experience the richness of childhood rather than early specialization or academic hothousing. The curriculum itself is a flexible set of pedagogical guidelines founded on Steiner's principles that take account of the whole child. It gives equal attention to the physical, emotional, intellectual, cultural and spiritual needs of each pupil and is designed to work in harmony with the different phases of the child's development. The core subjects of the curriculum are taught in thematic blocks and all lessons include a balance of artistic, practical and intellectual content. Whole class mixability teaching is the norm. Now, I'm pretty interested in the Steiner education. Unfortunately, my son didn't want to go to a Steiner school, but my three nephews did. So um, my lovely nephews, Loki, Boris and Dory so if they're listening hello to them there and my sister Lucy who lives in Bristol there's, there's a Steiner school in Bristol and my, as I say my three nephews were educated there and the principle behind um, the Steiner education is it takes into account the whole child and they really bring out into the world their artistic creative side which I think is is incredibly important you know not everybody wants to work in a factory or or get a degree in in medicine and become the best doctor in the world you know the creative side is very important and Steiner was very very much um, uh, a man of his time so not only was he a Pisces but when he was born Neptune was also in the sign of Pisces, which it is today. So actually, if you've got any children that are going to be born between now and 2026 and they're Pisces, boom, 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 depending on what date they were born, they'll have Neptune very near to their sun sign. Now, in um, Rudolf Steiner's case, his Mercury was right next door to his Neptune. His sun sign wasn't, but his Mercury was. And Mercury is, is the planet of thinking and thought. So if you want to understand the imagery of Neptune, which can get pretty difficult sometimes because it's such a woolly sort of description. And so Steiner, for that matter, when you read some of his writing, you just sort of like, what's he on about? But once you grasp it and you can sort of 
condense it down a bit, um, it will really help you understand more about the principles of Neptune and also how to get the best of it if you're a Pisces yourself. So it is absolutely um, a, a wonderful planet if you're a Pisces. And in Rudolf Steiner's case, because he was born towards the end of the Neptune transit, he didn't actually in his lifetime um, see the benefits of it. He saw a certain amount of it. I don't think he lived to be very old. I think he died when he was 60 or 70 or something. He wasn't terribly ancient. In fact, it might have been younger. I can't remember his age when he died. But the the tail of an end of his life actually saw him see the Steiner education be put into place. And it still exists today. So we can say that it, he created something that was very lasting. Now, he also invented a thing called anthroposophy. And I'll give you the definition of that. To nurture the life and soul of the individual in human society. And he used homeopathy and other natural forms of medicine alongside conventional medicine. And he also used biodynamic farming and gardening. So the anthroposophical is a horrible word. I hate it. But anthroposophy um, is the epitome of the Steiner movement. And it basically means, you know, let's stay in touch with nature. So I don't know if you watch the note, the news or anything at the moment, but being vegans pretty sort of high on the list, you know, people don't want to be killing animals anymore. And also biodynamic gardening and farming is pretty high as well. Now, I do apologise if you are listening live to this and I haven't said hello to you. Um, unfortunately, because I'm uh, using a PC as opposed to my mobile, I can't see who's actually listening. But if you are listening, so this is a little wave to you. Hello, my name's Mary English. I'm an astrologer. I work in private practice in the UK. You can get me at maryenglish.com. So that's an ancient Pisces person. As I say, the year that he was born was 1861. He is the epitome of Piscesness and somebody who was born under the influence of Neptune. So he was born under Neptune and he was also a Pisces. Yeah. So unless you were born today, you're not going to be under the influence of Neptune like uh, Mr. Rudolf Steiner was. And as I say, in this talk, I'm uh, going to be giving you some chart examples of uh, other Pisces people. So the other ones that I am including. So here we go. And these are all in the PDF. If you click on the link above, you'll be sent the PDF so you can read about more about this later. So now the next chart I have is uh, a young lady called Anita Morjani. Now you might... Um, he was 65 when he died. Thank you, Marion. Thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. Um, Anita Morjani is the author of a book called Dying to Be Me. Uh, she was born in 1959. I have her birth date, but I don't have accurate birth data for her. As I say, I've included her chart in the PDF and I've used a system called Whole House, which will allow you to see what signs of the zodiac she's got things in. But as far as the ascendant, I've got no idea what time she was born, so I don't know what happened there. However, now the reason I've, I've um, included her is you actually can find her on Facebook. She has got a Facebook page, so Google her, Anita Morjani, and it's M-O-O-R-J-A-N-I. And she's famous, I suppose is the word to describe, for writing a book called Dying to Be Me, which is the experience of her near-death experience. The experience of her near -death, the, due to the near-death experience that she had. And um, she was born in Singapore and while working and living in Hong Kong in February 2002, she was diagnosed with lymphoma in her neck. And after trying and, so after trying alternative and conventional medical treatments in February 2006, and after her family was told that nothing more could be done to save her because her cancer was too advanced, she fell into a coma. And it was during that coma state that she had a near-death experience and an out-of-body experience. And 30 years later, sorry, 30 hours later, not years, what am I saying? 30 hours later, after meeting her deceased father and deceased best friend, she was encouraged by them to return to her body and to live her life fearlessly. Her tumours shrank by 70% within seven days and in five weeks she was released from hospital cancer free. Now, just that piece of information is mind boggling enough. Not too many people, well, quite a lot of people have recovered from cancer. Um, but 
70% of her tumours shrinking within four days, to my mind, is pretty dramatic. And in five weeks, being released from hospital cancer free is, again, a bit of a a crazy one um, but everything is documented so nobody's making any of this up this is all perfectly perfectly true yeah and in March 2012 dying to be me the book was published by Hay House now the chart that I've included in the PDF um, has the date I've included there of the 3rd of May because in unfortunately on her Wikipedia page it says it was March 2012 it wasn't it was May let me correct that it was May 2012 in May 2012, uh, the book was released, and I thought, oh, and I wonder what was happening to the transits. So this is a Pisces lady, so she's got sun sign Pisces, she's got moon in Gemini, she's got Mercury in Aries and Venus in Aries, you know, and her own natal Neptune's in Scorpio. So I thought, you know, why, what was going on for her, what was going on for her? So the date that the book was published, Neptune had just started going into the sign of Pisces yeah so astrologically she I'm not saying she got cancer at the right time that would be a, a daft thing to say but publishing her book and talking about it and now devoting her life to uh, helping people live fearlessly yeah um, it's, it's pretty significant and when you read I mean she's written more than one book so I must say um, when you read uh, some of the information that she shares she wrote another lovely book all about heaven on earth that's that's a grand book um when you read the sort of things that she does now <clears throat> she's really living her piscesness she's not holding back from that um and i'll give you a little quote of her so she says when i am being love i don't get drained and I don't need people to behave a certain way in order to feel cared for or to share my magnificence with them. They're automatically getting my love as a result of me being my true self. And when I'm non-judgment, non-judgmental of myself, I feel that way towards others. So she has written a number of books. I mean, I've read two of them. I think there's some more knock it about somewhere um but the principles that she talks about in her books i mean you don't have to die of cancer goodness me you don't have to be near death of cancer to understand the concepts that she's talking about uh and i think she's a wonderful example of a pisces person who's functioning very well under a neptune transit i mean interestingly in her chart she has got a thing called a yod i don't know if you can see but there's a a, a, a a green triangle there is an isosceles triangle that thing is called a yod and where the yod points to is is where you need to uh, uh, donate dedicate your life and she's got moon in Gemini and her yod points to her moon so the moon in Gemini is someone that needs to chat and to talk and yak and write and whatever and she does all of those things she gives lots of talks I mean interestingly I'm a Pisces with moon in Gemini as well but I haven't written a New York Times bestseller um, with her uh, same home moon in Gemini she is living her chart at the moment by talking and speaking about the experience that she had uh, which actually I think happened under a Jupiter transit if I remember rightly Jupiter was transiting her own natal Neptune when she had her near-death experience yeah but she's now coming to understand because I think her sun sign's quite yeah it's 24 degrees Pisces and Neptune's only 11 degrees at the moment so she's getting towards being able to live her life in in more of a Pisces way okay so that's chart example number one is Anita Morjani and chart example number two this chap's fabulous he's actually fabulous now I I do follow him on Facebook as well and uh, and I listened to a couple of podcasts that he gave a little while ago he is the world's most interesting man he's called Dean Radin and he is get this uh, a scientific researcher I think wow how can a Pisces do that <laughs> the thing is he's not your bog standard scientific researcher because he works at uh, a, a place in America called called the Institute of Noetic Science which is a non-profit organization that um, researches into parapsychological uh, happenings so you think you know what's parapsychological well, parapsychology covers things like the mind-body connection psychic phenomena yeah, 
telepathy and all forms of non-conscious experience and I can happily say that Dean Radin is has dedicated his life to something that is very very Pisces and he's got an interesting chart so his sun sign is Pisces and his Mercury is Pisces lovely he's got moon in Taurus uh, so there, there you go, Marion, that's that's your sign. Um, with his moon in Taurus, that makes him very practical. So he does these weird and wacky experiments, you know, proving that you can be in one place, someone could be somewhere else, they could be writing something down and you can pick that information up. Um, but he's got the evidence for it. Yeah. So go check him out. Uh, Dean Radin, if you Google him, you'll find his website. It's amazing. Uh, he's written some grand, grand books. But um, one of the experiments that I thought was the, the most exciting that he did, and he did it uh, with some Buddhist monks, and it's a tea blessing ceremony. And the link to the, the actual research is in the PDF. If you click on the, uh, the link above in the description, it will take you to uh, a link that will let you have the free PDF. Um, the research that he did was uh, with some Buddhist monks, yeah? <laughs> Buddhist monks. So what he did, um, he got some Buddhist monks, he made some tea, he made the tea, I believe, and the Buddhist monks blessed it. And then he had another sample, because you needed control, because he's a scientific expert, he had another uh, some more tea that the Buddhist monks didn't bless. They sort of anti-blessed it. So uh, they made sure that the blessing from the first tea didn't influence the second uh, bunch of tea. Okay, And then he got 200 volunteers. A hundred of them actually got the tea and a hundred of them didn't. It was all completely blind. They all got a little vial. It was about this, this big, okay, that sort of size. A little vial of the, uh, the Tibetan tea that was blessed. And uh, some of them got it, some of them didn't. They had to take it, I think it was 10 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and then in the evening they had to fill out a mood questionnaire. And in the mood questionnaire, they were asked things like, you know, how happy were you feeling today? What was your life like? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah? And, uh, and in the research, um, this was the interesting thing. So he, he, in the questionnaire, they were asked, do you feel that you have the blessed tea? Yes or no? Right. Now, the people that believed that they had the blessed tea and the tea they had was blessed, their mood scale shot off the, the spectrum. OK, like this, their mood went mega. The ones that thought they had the tea but didn't actually have the tea, their mood went up a teeny bit. The ones that didn't think they had the blessed tea and didn't have the blessed tea, because these were the negative ones, nothing happened. The ones that didn't think they had the blessed tea and uh, had the blessed tea, their mood only changed a little bit. So what it was proven in the experiment was what's called the placebo effect, okay, so the ones that thought they had the tea and didn't, their, you know, their, their scale went up, but not as much as the ones that actually had it. But he was proving the placebo effect and what's called the nocebo effect. And the nocebo effect is if I tell you, you are going to fall over in 20 minutes, but you're more likely to fall over. If I say, oh, you know, in 20 minutes time, you're going to be dancing around the house, then <laughs> you'll probably be dancing around the house. Yeah. Um, so the, the interesting thing with that piece of uh, Pisces, that was such a Pisces bit of research, I, I absolutely I was chuckling listening to it. I was sat in the other room in front of the fire and I was listening to it on my iPhone with my earphones in and my husband was watching the telly. And I was going, that's a crazy bit of research. But trust me, Dean Radin, he's your man if you want proper Pisces research. And he has done research on the things that Pisces people understand, consciousness, dreams, uh, you know, being able to think about someone from 100 miles away and then, you know, they phone you up and, and you go, oh, I was just thinking about you that time of story. But uh, the, the Tibetan tea uh, bit of research was fabulous. And, and he sort of joked while he was talking about uh, the tea experiment. And he said, if you ever get a chance to have some tea blessed by Buddhist monks, he said, have it because it, it really affects your mood. Um, now, I have a lovely quote of his. Um, and because uh, he's, he's, he's sort of a bit deadpan. He, he doesn't intend to make jokes, but he comes out with these funny ones. And this one is here and it says, 
prayer is not an old woman's idle amusement. Properly understood and applied, it is the most potent instrument of action. So now he's not a believer in prayer, and we could use prayer in a broad spectrum here. He's not a a believer in prayer just sort of doing stuff he has done experiments to know that prayer is very beneficial so quite a lot of times i don't know about you but you'll see on facebook somebody's making a collection for someone who's not well or they're ill or whatever and i follow somebody who that happens to they were born with a congenital defect and the child is quite oftentimes in and out of hospital but they every now and again ask people to send prayers to this particular child and and you'll see the results that the child recovers now whether or not it's because of the the consciousness we don't know but Dean Madden does he knows for a fact that prayer and positive thought has a beneficial effect so his chart is also in the uh, PDF which you can download if you click on the link above my name's Mary English I'm a professional astrologer working in private practice in the UK welcome to my webinar we're talking about uh, we just talked a little bit about Neptune and what Neptune gets up to it's uh, one of the more distant planets in our solar system so it's not as far as Pluto it's the one just just in front of Pluto so if you're going all the way out from the earth into into uh, into our solar system out into deep space Neptune's the penultimate planet the last one in uh, the second last one in our solar system the last one being Pluto but I will be doing a talk about Scorpio and Pluto at some point but not today and incidentally, this talk is specifically for Pisces. So if you are other signs as well, please tell your Pisces friends the information that you're learning today. So he's number two. So he's Dean Radin. Now, my third example, and and I know a lady who's going to be very interested in this. So there's a lady called Nikki Marshall who will be tuning at some point. She lives in Bristol and she runs a thing called um, Discover Your Bounce. I think that's right. Um, there's a chappie called Tony Robbins. Now, Tony Robbins is a motivational speaker. Is that right? Yes, he's an American author, entrepreneur, philanthropist and life coach. But I'd initially call him a speaker because he does a lot of chat. He does a lot of, gosh, he's even more chatty than me. And uh, luckily, so those two charts, we don't have an accurate birth time, the two that I've just given examples, but they're classic examples of Pisces. With this gentleman, we do have his accurate birth time because he's born in America. This is the chart there. And again, it'll be in the PDF download. Um, Tony Robbins, because he was born in America, in America, your birth time Time is actually added to your birth certificate Yee! which isn't in the UK and he's a Pisces person he was born on the 29th of February 1960 he's got a Libra ascendant he has moon in Aries he's got Sun in Pisces in the fifth house this is somebody that does like a bit of drama in his life um, his Mercury is in the sign of Pisces as well that's right yes yeah, Sun of Mercury in Pisces and um, I've got a little bit of background information on this. So when he was a teenager, um, he grew up, sorry, I'll start from the beginning. He was born very poor. His stepfather, who was working as a salesman, struggled to take care of the family and couldn't even afford to celebrate Thanksgiving or Christmas. And so when Robbins was a teenager, his mum wanted him to be a truck driver um, because he'd make twice what his father made but he ultimately decided to follow his passion instead of chasing the money he decided that he wanted to grow up helping people in need a wise decision since he's now something his worth is something like half a billion dollars now he's a very successful Pisces and is now under the influence of Neptune okay so Neptune uh, so there's his sun sign just there and there's Neptune almost exactly conjuncting his sun sign at the moment. And in 2014, when Neptune just started, the, uh, 20, it was just a little bit before 2012 that Neptune just started its transit. So in 2014, he donated the profits of his book, Money Master the Game, along with additional personal donations through a thing called Feeding America to provide meals to people in need. The combined donations fed a hundred million, that's a lot of people, needy people in 2014 to 2015, according to the charity. And Tony partnered with the charity again in 2016 to provide another hundred million more meals. Now, as far as uh, Pisces altruism goes, I'd say that that's pretty high on the list of people that are doing something that's in keeping with their sign. Um, 
On the 2nd of February 2017, so that's this year, Feeding America announced that a 100 million more meals challenge and conducted a partnership with Robbins helping provide more than uh, 1.1 101.6 million meals to children, families and seniors through the Feeding America's network of 200 member food banks from 2016. So that's an awful lot of people that he's brought about the feeding of. Um, he's also donating. So he's, I say he's recently, since Neptune started transiting his chart into the sign of Pisces, he started rather than just making more money and going on more holidays and jetting around the world and stuff, he started donating his money. So it's sort of like he's reached a threshold, like, I don't need any more money, what am I going to do with it? And he's benefiting people because he started out life as very poor and he doesn't want anybody to be poor and hungry like himself. And I thought it was grand wonderful thing um so he's also donating the profits of his book unshakable your financial freedom playbook to the feeding america campaign so great guy yeah and i've got a lovely quote of his it's what you practice in private that you'll be rewarded for in public and uh yeah so those are the three chart examples of pisces people OK, so it might seem to you as if you're a Pisces person. Well, that's a long intro. What does that mean for me? OK, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. So how long do we have to enjoy this transit? So Neptune briefly went into Pisces on the 5th of April 2011. So you need to look back in your diary and see what was happening for you then if you're a Pisces. Um, and then it went retrograde on the 6th of August 2011 and it came back back into Pisces on the 4th of February 2012. I think, uh, yes, because that's the year that, um, I'm sure that's right, yeah, that's the year that Anita Morjani released her book. So it was retrograde up until then and then when it went direct. Um, and it did some more retrograding in 2012 and 2013, but it still say it stayed in the sign of Pisces. So today, which is the 30th of November 2017, so if you're looking at this tomorrow, this is the day that I'm doing this broadcast, the 30th of November 2017, Neptune is 11 degrees into the sign of Pisces. Now, the way we work in astrology, each sign of the zodiac, there's 12 of them, have a segment of the circle that we call the zodiac. So each sign of the zodiac is 30 degrees big. So when we're saying something's transiting, we've got it to be able to go 30 degrees of that sign before it'd be into the next sign. So with Neptune being 11 degrees into the sign of Neptune, Neptune being in the sign of Pisces, we're a third of the way through this wonderful transit. Yeah. So it finishes the transit in 2026. So we've got a few more years for it to transit. And now, depending on what degree your sun sign is, depends how affected you are by this transit at the moment. So in my case, Neptune's conjuncting, but not exact my sun sign, as my sun sign is 15 degrees Pisces. So it's 11 degrees at the moment. My sun sign's 15. I've got four degrees to go until it's absolutely conjunct. Whew, it's not that at the moment. And to, But to make a conjunction in astrology, we need to, something needs to be within eight degrees of something else. So if it's within eight degrees, we can say it's conjunct. It's not exact conjunct, but it's a bit sort of like somebody walking nearer and nearer and nearer to you and they're not standing right next to you until they're exactly the same degree of sign, but they could be very near to you and you might be able to reach out and touch them. That's a little bit how it works in astrology. Eight degrees we classify in astrology as being near enough to, to, to be a, what we call a conjunction. Um, so I've included in the uh, PDF, which you can click the link for up there, um, where the transits are going to be. And um, so what you need to do is to find out your sun sign and how many degrees it is into Pisces and then compare that to where Neptune is at the moment and how near or far are those. So if you're an early born Pisces and you were born in February, because I'm a March Pisces, then Neptune will already have passed your sun sign. So Nikki, if you're listening, it's already, I'm sure you're an early Pisces, because there was a big confusion about whether or not you're Aquarius, but you're not your Pisces. Neptune has already transited. Now, I can't remember the rest of your chart, so I don't know where the rest of the planets are. Uh, but Neptune will have made that transit. It might still be within a degree of it, and you've still got until 2026, 2026 to make the best of the transit. But keeping in mind that every time it goes retrograde, 
everything that you've done is going to unravel. Um, so I have included the dates uh, for 2018 when it's going to uh, go retrograde, which I can tell you because I wrote it somewhere. Where did I write it? 2018. It's June 2018, right up until November the 25th. I think it was the something like the 8th or 9th of June next year until November the 25th. Neptune's going retrograde. So be very careful if you're organizing something next year between those dates that you're very, very clear about what you are doing most important. Now, I have organized this webinar during a Neptune transit retrograde, whatever was I doing. And so I waited until the retrograde had finished to be able to make this broadcast today because I, I want to be able to make sure a lot of people understand about Neptune. It's vitally important that you as a Pisces makes the best of this transit because it's not going to happen again in your lifetime. It's not going to happen again in your children's lifetime. I mean, 1861, was that the year that I said that uh, where's his name hold on um rudolf steiner was born in 1861 that was the last time neptune was in pisces it, it ain't going to be doing it again for a while so you need to make the best of it now um so what do you need to do during this transit what's important for you OK, so I've got some key words here. Now, this is what you don't want to do during a Neptune transit. OK, so don't be nebulous, impressionable, too dreamy, too emotional, too sensitive, too sentimental, too woolly, too wandering or unstable. Those are things you mustn't be during this Neptune transit because if you do and I think uh, we can use an example in the news at the moment there's the chappy called Mr Weinstein I can't remember his first name but he's an American he's got himself into a deep amount of trouble and quite rightly so uh, because he wasn't working with the positive effect of Neptune so he's getting the negative side of it so to get the positive side of a Neptune transit you need to be artistic imaginative practically idealistic, heartfelt, inspired, altruistic, genuine, loving and self-aware. That's the most important thing, yeah, that during the Neptune transit, you get yourself to be um, self-aware and astrology will help you do that. So um, where was Neptune when you were born? So if you're born between 1942 and 1956, your own natal Neptune will be in the sign Libra. And I think that's our chart example that Dean Radin has his Neptune. Yes, is in the sign of Libra and it's conjunct Saturn. So his own birth chart doesn't have a particularly good relationship with his own natal Neptune, which is just as well that he's having this nice Neptune transit now because he won't be working against himself. Yeah. Uh, if you were born between 1956 and 1970, then your Neptune will be in the sign of Scorpio. So that's when I was born. And Anita and also Tony were born. Uh, Anita was born in, hold on, Tony was born in 1960, which is the same year as me. And Anita, what have I done with her chart? I've now hidden it. Anita was born in 1959 okay and Tony was born in 1960 so both of them and me were born with uh, Neptune being in the sign of Scorpio so Neptune's now in Pisces natally we have Neptune in the sign of Scorpio Scorpio and Pisces get on so we'll enjoy even more this Neptune transit yeah if you were born between 1970 and 1984, your natal Neptune will be in the sign of Sagittarius. Now, I'm sorry to tell you that the present transit won't be quite so fluffy for you. So you need to have your chart checked out, yeah, because that will form a square. Um, and that might be a little bit challenging for you. If you were born between 84 and 98, your natal Neptune will be in Capricorn. Hooray, hurrah, Neptune transiting through Pisces will be beneficial for you. If you were born between 1998 and 2012, so these are the recent babs, um, it, your natal Neptune will be in Aquarius. So you might find the present uh, transit through the sign of Pisces, again, a bit challenging because, again, that will form some weird sort of aspect to your sun sign. Um, so there we go. That's some information about uh, Neptune.
and its transit through the sign of Pisces. I hope you've enjoyed the information today. Uh, the podcast show notes, podcast webinar show notes, um, which you can access by clicking on the link above, will give you the further information. If you've missed this webinar and you want the information, there, it's all there. You can listen back to the webinar if you like. You can get your chart done for free by going to www.astro.com. It's a great Swiss website. You can have your chart done up. There's lots of analysis in there. Um, I will be putting into the uh, the PDF a link to my podcast, which describes about next Neptune. You can have sessions with me if you go to my website, maryenglish.com. All my books are on Amazon. Um, you're here on my author page. I'm on Twitter. It's just Mary English. That's my Twitter address. You've got my Facebook account here. And as I say, I'm the author of uh, 16 plus books. And if I did know who was listening at the moment, I would uh, ask so how are Rudolph Stein, so how is that surname spelt which surname's that Marion I'm not gonna, gonna answer any questions whose surname uh Radin is R-A-D-I-N so let me put that in there so Radin oh Dean yes Radin and he's on Facebook there we go that should yes Dean Radin, R-A-D-I-N, and he has got his own page on Facebook. And Anita Morjani has as well, and I'm sure Tony Robbins has as well. All of these people will be on Facebook if you want to follow them. Because my advice is that if you're a Pisces at the moment, you're not sort of quite sure about your Pisces-ness, my advice would be to uh, to follow those uh, particular people um, because uh, they're going to give you lots of um, inspiration necessary for you to be able to enjoy the transit. Now, the uh, I suppose my, my closing comment would be that it is important as a Pisces to do those things that you enjoy, to do the things that bring you joy. So if you're working in a job and you absolutely hate it, that's fine. You won't be able to change your job overnight. But spend some of your time, at least 25% of your time, doing the things that you enjoy. Now, I didn't get into my Neptune transit or into my enjoyable life until I was much older and probably not until I had my son. And he's now 24. And, and I became pres professional in this field of work. So I became, you know, a, a, I did started as a psychic reader and, and then wrote the books and, and I trained in homeopathy, et cetera, and hypnotherapy and stuff. So I wouldn't say that I really came into my Pisces-ness until much later in my life. I didn't get the hang of my life at all. So if that's the place that you're in at the moment, you, you'll get the boost of Pisces at the minute, yeah? And uh, and you'll find that you'll benefit it by doing the things that bring you joy and you'll know what brings you joy. You'll be doing those things and be going, wow, I'm really enjoying this. This is great. You know, think enjoy and joy are the two things. So if you do something you enjoy, that brings you joy. So everybody has to go to work. Everybody has to earn a living. Everybody has to do the boring bum stuff. But don't spend all of your time doing that and eventually merge into those things that just bring you joy. You just don't waste the time in the stuff that doesn't. I mean, you know, take some tips from Anita the the second book of hers which is about something about heaven on earth is in the title um in there she gives a wonderful she answers a whole load of questions that people have answered, asked her you know how do I manage my grump, grumpy mother-in-law type of stuff well just don't she's grumpy nothing you can do about it do what makes you happy looking after yourself first is probably one of the most important things and it's something that Pisces aren't particularly good at I mean, how many Pisces do you know that are, are good at looking after themselves? They're, they're rubbish at it. They're brilliant at looking after loads of other people, but not themselves. Um, so during this transit, makes sure that you're doing the stuff that you love. And then and then eventually what happens is it, it filters out to everybody else. You know, I'm doing all these things and they bring me joy. And, and other people are benefiting by that as well. Just the fact that you're so excited about whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah. Um, I mean, Marion, who's listening to uh, the uh, the webinar at the moment, she she's a flower essence healer. She, uh, you know, she she does some amazing work. Admittedly, she's not a Pisces, but she's already living very much her sign. She does gardening. That's very much a Taurus thing. She's very practical and down to earth, but she's got a bit of a mystical, spiritual side. I think she's got um, 
Marion, I think you've got Leo ascendant. I can't remember the sign of your moon. I apologise, but I know you've got sun sun quite high in your chart, and you got into flower essences at a very early age, and you've made that your life. So you know, all credit to you. And uh, and I know your brother is Pisces, and I know he does uh, cartoons. Is that right? He does art and and a bit of comedy and stuff. You think your brother's a Leo? Oh no, your ascendant is Leo. Yes, you was, and your moon's Leo as well, is it? All right, I know your ascendant's Leo, um, but your brother's a Pisces, isn't he? Um, and I think he's he's living his chart at the moment. He's doing the things that he enjoys. It's it's very very important because otherwise, what happens is that you know, one minute you're alive, the next minute you're dead, and you haven't lived your whole life. So. Just 25% of your time doing the stuff that you really enjoy. It might just be in the evenings. Yeah, your brother is. It might just be the evenings. It might it might just be the early morning before you go to work that you lie and look at the stars or something. Uh, you know, Pisces type of subjects are artistic, creative, etc. But I wouldn't say there was anything artistic and creative about being a scientist, what Dean Radin is, but he's he's researching things that are um, all about consciousness you know how crazy is that how wonderful is that that are con because he doesn't talk about individual consciousness you know we've got conscious of our body that there's a greater consciousness that we can all tap into and one of the lovely um talks that he gives he gives this sort of um, um a mountain or a pyramid or whatever you want to call it and underneath it is is the representation of stuff that we just don't understand the collective unconscious that we can all tap into and as I say he's done research that would demonstrate that yeah how fabulous is that so thank you very much for listening today um uh, if you've got any questions please ping me over an email you can um, add the uh, questions to my uh, Facebook page. So uh, uh, Mayor English author page, you can pop a few questions on there afterwards. I'm going to be signing off in a minute and the webinar will save and it'll be on the page. You can listen back to it. And I say, please click on the link and I'll be able to send, uh, send you by email the PDF information on this with the dates in, etc. So I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Thank you very much for listening and I'm going to go now. Bye-bye now.